we've got a, a great topic and a very timely topic. And we also have a, a diverse uh, set of panelists. And today's format is a little different than, than in the past. So this is gonna be really a, a, an open mic round table discussion as opposed to presentations. And uh, we, we, you know, we hope to build on um, the experience that each of the panelists has had over the past couple of years dealing with um, COVID and uh, the way that they're looking at um, making modifications both to the hardware and software of the facilities that they operate uh, going forward. Uh, there's obviously a science behind this and um, certainly Paula is uh, certainly up to date on sort of the infection control perspective related to uh, positive and negative pressure rooms and types of procedures that can occur in each. So um, that's, that's the general topic for discussion today. Uh, I'm not gonna read the panelists' uh, names. You, you should all see them on there. Um, but in general, what we wanna do is talk about uh, lessons learned, code updates that we're aware of that are coming down the road. Um, sort of infection control review of uh, and emergency responses to COVID, benefits of enhancing pressurization capability of floors over and above rooms, and um, you know the documentation of, of staff infections working in negative pressure spaces. And then, um, you know, I think as we're all aware, the more air we, air we move through our buildings, the higher the energy usage and costs. So um, that's not to be forgotten, but uh, obviously we've got to do the right thing from the infection control side. So, so what, why, don't, why don't we get into it? And I'm going to, uh, uh, I think what I'd like to do is just talk more generally first about um, what folks have been doing and keep it to about 10 minutes um, round table. Um, what folks have been doing uh, over the past couple of years kinds of things that they think we'd be interested in hearing about and then perhaps come back and talk about the science of what's been learned over these two years from the infection, infection control side and then what it means going forward. Okay, so um, Steve, you're right up center on my screen for some reason. So would you like to uh, begin the discussion? What's been going sure. on down at uh, Yale New Haven? Sure, John, thanks. Um, so as everybody knows, the last several years have been quite an interesting journey. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, Yale New Haven, we actually had a uh, large project on the books. We were, uh, you know, end of 2019, early into 20, we were completing design development drawings on a um, $800 million neuroscience tower on our St. Raphael's campus. And, uh, then we all know what happened on uh, around March of 2020. Uh, all of our worlds changed for, um, uh, well, I won't say the better, but uh, certainly they changed. And um, we, uh, we all reacted um, and, uh, what, you know, dealing with the pandemic and, um, you know, the need for negative pressure rooms, um, you know, jumped uh, you know, substantially. And, uh, you know, when you're a system our size, uh, you've got uh, varying vintage of buildings. And as we say, you've seen one patient tower, you've seen one patient tower. So the need to convert negative pressure rooms was different probably from just about every building we had. So um, taking, taking that experience and, and looking at some of our buildings that actually did have um, you know, pandemic capability, which we did put into play. Um, we made whatever we could make negative. Uh, we put air polishers, HEPA filtered air polishers in where we couldn't uh, create negative pressure, but needed uh, to create a safe environment for uh, staff. And so uh, working with our inf infection prevention folks, you know, we really came up with a playbook of uh, different ways we could treat our inpatient uh, facilities. We then were able to take a pause on our uh, new tower project and went into a lessons learned mode uh, during that pause, uh, you know, working with, you know, Shepley, Bullfinch, BR plus A and Turner and all of our project team and really reevaluated the number of negative pressure rooms we had in that facility, where they were located and went back and 
you know, we had actually thought about adding more of our pandemic mode, uh, SARS mode, as we called it, um, at the time, uh, you know, the number of floors we had, you know, in, in 2019, uh, you know, 2018, we were like, yeah, I think we're okay with what we have in the Smilo Cancer Hospital. We'll be okay with, uh, with the three floors we have there and uh, based on past experience. Of course, we all know that changed. And uh, we went back and added uh, probably double the number of uh, negative pressure rooms in the facility, but also added uh, another floor of SARS mode into the new tower and added a pandemic floor as well. Uh, so that we could increase our capability to deal with uh, what may be coming down the road. The good news is, you know, when you're in design, in, uh, in design documents, and it is a automatic building automation uh, controls exercise, um, you know, some hardware, uh, some reconfiguration of air handlers that we hadn't bought yet, um, you know, the cost for that is uh, not, uh, not significant. It's not insignificant but it's a lot easier to change on paper on a, a project you haven't bid yet. So <clears throat> that project is, uh, we've broken ground on it. We're underway. And, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, it was probably added about $6 million in cost at the time uh, to the overall project budget. Uh, and so, of course, buying the project out uh, after the pandemic was uh, a lot of fun as well as uh, everyone else knows. So, uh, we're facing our challenges with that, but that's uh, that's it in a nutshell. That's what's going on with us. So, Stu, just a, a quick question, and and it's uh, I don't know if you have this data on top of your head, but generally, percentage wise, how many negative pressure rooms did you think you had going into COVID, and how many would you percentage wise do you think you'll have um, after the new building? Well, I'm going to phone a friend and uh, Scott, you yeah. probably know that off the top of your head because you were deep into it with me. Yeah. Um, you so take think, a guess and I'll, I'll agree. Okay. All right. I, I think pre COVID uh, for this tower, you know, we were maybe doing a couple of rooms per unit. Um, and uh, post pandemic, uh, we're probably closer to uh, 10 to 15% of the building. Uh, officially negative pressure rooms, in addition to the the SARS mode or the pandemic mode floors that Steve already mentioned. Mm -hmm. So definitely so, an increase. Yeah, so if we were one room per 30, maybe in some cases two rooms per 30, you know, we were probably up closer to four per 30 now. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's, and that's on all, whether it's a med surge or a ICU floor. Yeah, so. it's across all, all. Yeah, uh, yeah, just give us that flexibility. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, while we're in Connecticut, Elizabeth, um, anything to add from Stanford Health's side around this okay. issue? Yeah, right. so similarly to what um, Stephen described, um, we were very fortunate that we opened um, our 340,000 square foot new tower in 2016. Um, and we had significantly increased um, our capacity from a negative pressure standpoint when we opened the new tower. Um, our tower serves uh, for our emergency department, all of our perioperative areas, our critical care units, as well as the vast majority of our inpa adult inpatient beds. Um, but, you know, given everything that happened uh, during the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and what we saw from a demand for utilization of critical care beds, um, we did decide to make additional investments around negative pressure. So, um, specifically, you know, when we opened the tower, um, we were in double digit percentage as far as, um, you know, the number of negative pressure rooms that we deployed. Um, that was purposeful on our part when we opened the new tower, but we've additionally um, outfitted um, another 12 of our critical care beds um, in our step down unit, which is where we see the highest concentration of patients. Um, so our entire ICU step down now will be negative pressure. Um, and, you know, we have additionally outfitted um, some of the other areas that we utilize for testing services with negative pressure capabilities, especially when we have to turn on and off the spigot in relationship to the volume of testing that we're doing. 
we've seen no um, staff transmission um, of uh, COVID from a patient, and we continue to monitor that. Um, and, you know, we felt that it was appropriate to continue to make investments around that just because we don't know what else the future has in store for us from, you know, an infectious disease standpoint. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Paul, would you like to speak to B.I. Leahy's response? Well, we didn't live in the land of Oz of, you know, um, Mass General Yale with those uh, uh, heavy finances. But we actually, we did, you know, struggle through, I think, just as everybody did, with the lack of information that everybody had um, coming, you know, going into the the pandemic, we didn't know what it was that we were fighting, and I think we were looking for any means possible to to make changes and protect the patients and staff um, with anything that we did. I think we all struggled with what how we were going to create those those negative pressure rooms. Some places don't, didn't have the uh, operable windows within the patient rooms. Some did. We were fortunate enough to do that with the ones that we um, had the ability or had the available windows. We exhausted uh, directly outside. Um, obviously, it does take a little bit of a um, a jump in your consumption of, of, of energy, but that's it's what it's what we did. It made made the um, patients feel better and um, the staff feel better. Um, we have actually already begun to implement some of those changes in our design um, of renovation of uh, patient wings in the. Uh, uh, replacement of air handling units. We did actually go through and um, create a number of, uh, actually we, we uh, created two, two negative pressure wings, not isolation room, but negative pressure. Um, and I think there was always seemed to be this, um, uh, this back and forth with the nursing staff. Well, isn't this an isolation room? Aren't we were supposed to be going out there and measuring it to be uh, to, to make sure it meets meets the uh, uh, code, but it's uh, no. This is just negative pressure. Um, but in doing so, I think we've all realized, you know, what it is that we had to fight and be be aware of. Um, when you start to go ahead and make those adjustments, you've got to have your staff that are trained and they have the tools to go ahead and do the uh, balance reports. Because when you do it, make a change here. It affects everything else, you know, uh, upstream or surrounding it. So it was more about of a tag team that in supporting your own staff to make sure that they would, you know, they had to stay on it. This was a tricky time. Um, and as we think about how do we get back to it, I mean, how do we design for the future? We have to make it simple. We have to make it idiot proof for whatever we put in there with, you know, with technology that we also put the tools that we monitor ourselves or a checklist that says, be sure that you do this and check this. And it may be in a far, I mean, a, a far away space, um, something that you may not think about. Well, I've got to make, I have to make sure all of my boundaries are protected. So I think it's um, been a tremendous learning curve, but I think a lot of us have certainly with certainly groups like this, we've all actually come up with new ideas. You know, what have you tried? What have you tested? This has been fabulous um, as far as trying to get that communication out. Because the only place that we would go, I think, uh, you know, you know, Steve and uh, Scott, and um, where were we going? We were trying to go to the ASHU website as we're trying to figure it out. But even the, the messages that were on there, there was not enough um, information how to go ahead and uh, get out of the first few weeks. Um, so this has actually been, you know, a fabulous means of communicating. Paul, can I just ask, uh, you've got a new building. What, what does that look like in terms of capability? It has an, uh, a lot of that flexibility already be uh, built in. Um, and uh, um, I think that they're more ready for, the, you know, the pandemic than uh, eight or any pandemic as, as we moved down, they were able to make some changes, you know, they were deep into the, you know, the design uh, stages and well into construction, um, but they took advantage of that, you know, the, the period where they were under construction and they, they could make those changes much more easily as until after 
as opposed to have to be in flooded locations. And is that on a room by room basis or is it by floor or if you don't know it's set up? Um, it's, I guess you could say that they actually have the flexibility um, to <clears throat> do parts of a floor, but, um, uh, and, and the whole floor. I was, I was quite impressed the way that they had designed it. Okay. Well, we, we can come back to the engineering piece. Thanks, Paul, uh, Steve, rather. Um, let's see, Kirsten, are you with us from Johns Hopkins? Anything to like to share in this conversation? I guess Kirsten is not here. Okay. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about the, um, the science? Paula, would uh, you feel comfortable just sort of where we were, what we've learned, where we are, where you think we're going with, with the negative pressure, negative positive pressure? Um, sure. I think- I Big think... topic. I know you can speak for an hour or two on this. But, uh... <laughs> oh. Well, I didn't prepare to speak for an hour or two on this topic. A few minutes is fine. Thank a few you. minutes is fine. I think that for me, um, and you're probably all going to be shocked by this, I don't think too much has changed since the 2003 CDC environmental guidelines, um, which was kind of the Bible when I, that when I began in infection control around the environment of care. It has certainly been updated. Um, as an infection preventionist, I firmly believe that we need to understand what a protected environment room is and who it's for, and what an airborne infection isolation room is and who it's for, what the design requirements are for an airborne infection isolation room. And we also need to understand the design of a combination uh, AIPE which is an airborne infection isolation room for an immunocompromised patient. If you begin with those um, specific rooms that are designed, the PE room is designed for the severely immunocompromised, it's positive pressure, supply is HEPA filtered. The goal is to protect patients from airborne fungi because they can die from invasive fungal infections. Those patients also are very high risk for developing airborne diseases, such as disseminated herpes zoster and, and even measles um, or chickenpox. Those patients, when they develop an airborne disease, we have to figure out a way to keep the airborne virus from traveling out into the corridor and exposing visitors or staff, but at the same time, try to continue to protect them from exposure to dust. So that's where we have a combination AIPE. Um, the, uh, the design of that, there's two options for how to design that in the ASHRAE um, 170, um, but you end up controlling the ante room. At Mass General, the ante room will be positive to the patient room. And another way to say that is the patient room is negative to the ante room. And then the ante room is positive to the corridor. So you keep those infectious viral particles in the room, but staff can come into the ante room to don their PPE. Um, I know I'm going sort of over this. I think it's, it's important because uh, COVID presents challenges because sometimes you have an immunocompromised patient who may have COVID who requires an aerosol generating procedure and how, where do you do that? So then there's your, your, your standard airborne infection isolation room, which requires, you know, obviously the 12 air changes per hour, the dedicated exhaust, the negative pressure gradient of 0 0.1, et cetera, um, does not require an ante room. Um, but as of the 2022 guidelines, if you're going to build new, you have to go through your infection grow risk assessment to decide whether you're going to have an ante room. Um, those rooms are very specialized isolation rooms with very specific um, intents. The airborne infection isolation room is to prevent true airborne diseases, smallpox, chickenpox, measles, from escaping the room and exposing non-immune staff or visitors outside that room. And I think none of that has changed. As far as 
SARS and COVID-19, COVID um, whenever there is a new infectious agent um, that uh, uh, arises in the world, you always start with the most restrictive. And then as you learn and understand about how it transmits, then you can back off. So CDC's guidance is gonna be the most restrict restrictive at the beginning. At this point, and I spent some time this morning because um, I haven't been on site now since the spring of 2020, I am retired. I've been, I've been working sort of remotely on the new building uh, things. So I had to kind of update myself on what has changed since I left in those early days. And I don't think too much has changed. No one has yet proven that SARS-CoV-19 is an airborne disease, a true airborne disease. It is primarily spread via respiratory droplets um, over six feet. It's not coming out the door when you open the door and going down the corridor like measles and chicken pox can do. There have been outbreaks on floors, you know, that are documented in the literature going back decades, um, that those diseases can spread on a unit because coming it'll come out the door and down the hall. What we have determined is that when you do an aerosol generating procedure, such as intubation or suctioning, um, that in fact, smaller particles can be dispersed into the air and they can travel somewhat further. So the recommendation is, when possible, place patients with, with uh, COVID-19 who are going to undergo aerosol generating procedures um, in a negative pressure environment. Do you know how hard that is? on a day-to-day -day basis when you're admitting patients, you, you know, there's not a plan right off the bat that this person is gonna need nebulizers down the road or this person's gonna be intubated down the road. Um, the, it, so it's hard to know in advance when you're admitting SARS, uh, a, a COVID-19 patient, that they're going to have an aerosol generating procedure. So they get put in the standard room, standard room with your um, six air changes an hour, neutral pressure, um, and they can be, you know, if you're in a facility like Mass General, which still has two bedrooms, you cohort them in the same room and you rely on your uh, PPE um, for uh, control and exposure to, um, uh, to the uh, particles in the room. Oh, Liz, Liz has a question. Can she ask sure. a question? Go ahead, Liz. I was just going to actually add a comment to what Paul is saying. And um, just so everybody knows, I'm also a registered nurse. Mm -hmm. um, we decided to make the investment that we made from a negative pressure standpoint in our ICU step down because we do a significant number of aerosol generating procedures. A lot of organizations deploy the use of high flow oxygen, mm -hmm. um, which is considered to be aerosol generating. And the majority of the patients that have COVID um, get sent to that particular step down and, and high flow is one of the first lines of, of therapeutics that we use from a supplemental oxygen standpoint for patients with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think understanding that everybody has limited resources in healthcare, you know, making some of these incremental investments where they're going to be of the most help for you. Um, and and the most benefit from an infection prevention standpoint is is probably what's going to be feasible for all of us when you know dealing with with COVID um, on a long term basis. So um, I just would have that uh, the question for you is when you refer to the step down as being made negative pressure, did you make individual AII rooms? Your whole entire step down are individual AII rooms. Okay. Yes. Because the, the challenge that I, and I think I heard this from Paul, is that understanding, you know, staff get very confused around isolation rooms. Um, before COVID, they get confused around isolation rooms. And when you say negative pressure, so I think that we all know that you can take a space and through engineering magic, yes. turn the airflow around and make it negative. It doesn't make it an airborne infection isolation room. That's and correct. That is one of the scary things for infection control professionals is that once people say, oh, it's negative pressure, they're going to put a chicken pox or a measles case in there and we're going to be in big trouble because, in fact, it's not dedicated exhaust. Uh, it's re-entrained into another, um, you know, circulatory 
circulatory or another air handling system without heat infiltration. So it's critically important to understand what the difference is between um, a negative pressure environment, sort of a general negative pressure environment and a true airborne infection isolation room and, and how to use those. Um, I think that um, I'd love to know what is meant by SARS mode or pandemic floor. And I'm gonna make a guess that it is similar to what we had in place. So, you know, post 9-11, um, when everybody was worried about bio threats and everybody was doing bio threats planning um, at Mass General, we did have a floor that could be made negative pressure should there be a smallpox bioterror event. Um, but we knew that floor, that every person on that floor was gonna be wearing a fit tested N95 respirator, that the elevator lobby and the double doors between the elevator lobby was going to be our ante room and the entire floor was going to be an AAI room and the air was going outside on a, in a 16th, um, you know, 16th floor tower. So those kinds of modifications, one has to have a good relationship with infection control um, and know what it is you're doing and who can, who can be there. The other so, thing so that happens Paula, is, Sorry, could yeah. I just interrupt? Uh, Paul, were you Trying to say yeah, something. I, I, and I'm Paula. You, you brought up a very good point because I didn't in, in our explanation of changing those rooms. Absolutely, and one of those precautionary um, items is not to return the air. And the wings that we actually ended up changing, I had basically cut out sections and and we exhausted it outside, so there was definitely a separation. And mm -hmm. in design, in um, what needs, you know, I guess to go a little bit further is actually when you do your new designs, you have to create the designs within the air handling unit that it's going to end up through automation, go ahead and closing and opening dampers that make this 100% outside air coming in and 100% exhaust. But you are, uh, I'm glad you brought it up and I'm glad you noted that it, it wasn't stated, but that's the precautionary pieces where you have to have the people that are actually thinking a little bit deeper. It can't be, you know, in, in a silo when they make that decision that, okay, this is going to end up being a negative pressure area. Well, that is my wing, but I now have to check everything, all, all the other checks and balances, including the isolation room that's actually within that suite, because you just made everything else in that area, you know, um, neg negative pressure, drawing that pressure, changing the pressure relationship from the inside to the outside of that isolation. Sorry. No, that that's... That's perfect. That's, I think, um, excellent point. If you still have, if you have a quote, pandemic floor that's been ma made negative um, and it's a smallpox outbreak that we're seeing, God forbid, you know, in any of our lifetimes, we see a smallpox outbreak, is that the entire, that the entire floor may be negative, but staff are gonna have to wear N95 respirators 100% of the time um, because the smallpox can come out the doors. Those aren't AII, unless you put the person in that AIIR room. Um, I'm going to sort of wind up with one thing that um, we also, what was also a challenge at Mass General, because again, you know, high flow oxygen, there's the list of things that are considered aerosol generating procedures. That was one of the biggest challenges early on was agreeing on a list of what those procedures were because it kept changing from the CDC, what's an aerosol generating procedure, what's not. And they never said you couldn't do one in a regular patient room. They just said, if possible, move them to a negative pressure environment. And they said that several years ago around influenza, but I don't know that any hospitals moved influenza patients to negative pressure environments to do aerosol generating procedures. Um, but on floors, we have floors in, in the Lunder building that are dedicated to hematology oncology, where they're all protected environment rooms, or we have multiple protected environment rooms. And because we needed to have more rooms, those protected environment rooms were backed off to be neutral. And the, all the signage had to be changed and the staff had to be re-educated that they, if they did get an immunocompromised patient who was admitted <clears throat> and needed a protected environment, they couldn't use those rooms anymore. So ensuring that the facilities and the buildings and grounds uh, folks know, you know, keep a list. Okay, these 10 rooms used to be 
protected environment rooms. Now we've made them neutral and they can't be used as a protected environment room. At what point, as we're trying to go back to normal, is somebody making sure and checking off and putting these back into the appropriate mode and changing the signage and making sure staff understand the signage because that was a real concern right at the, uh, at the beginning. So, um, and as far as I know, and I did some reading this morning, nosocomial um, COVID, um, I don't think has been an issue. Um, we, you know, during regular influenza season, we see a few cases of nosocomial influenza, but we never know for sure if it was family or visitor exposure or an incubating staff person exposure. Uh, but in terms of outbreaks of transmission of COVID uh, in hospitals or transmission of COVID to staff when they've had the appropriate PPE and the, um, et cetera, um, has not materialized. I, I saw a paper published by the Brigham. Um, in fact, they had two cases, one of which they thought could be exposed by a, a family member exposure and the other they couldn't uh, define, but they looked at uh, a large number of cases. Um, and there wasn't nosocomial transmission. So that tells me that our PPE and our interventions around PPE and infection control have been effective at protecting staff and other patients from acquiring it in the hospital. Paula, thank you, as always. That's, that was just a fantastic overview of the way we approach um, these different room types. So, mm -hmm. Alan, as an engineer, this gets more and more complicated every day, right? Designing yeah. these systems. So what are you seeing from uh, ER plus A? And then Jason, um, I'd like you to jump into um, with um, some of the work that you've been doing inside MGB in general. Um, I think, you know, the, the other issue here is, I mean, me mechanically, electronically, you know, we can do software, hardware stuff to make things change now. We're getting pretty sophisticated with it. But communicating to the staff about what the heck's going on in a room on a floor at a particular time, you know, that has got to be incredibly challenging and you can't afford to get it wrong, right? And so um, how, how are we dealing with those systems? And perhaps there's, perhaps there's some other <laughs> folks we can talk to who are not on this call about, about that. But um, Alan, why don't you get into what the engineering implications of all of this are? And what sure. you're seeing too, I, you know, where some of your clients are headed sure. in terms of new new performance requirements for buildings. I think Paula gave an excellent summary about all the different uh, nuances of, of the different types of rooms. <clears throat> um, you know, on newer projects, we're seeing, uh, you know, there's a fine line between the capital budget, um, the energy conservation side, uh, move towards electrification, uh, and the ability to you know basically provide 100% outside air to make them negative pressure rooms for an entire building it it creates um the the systems are required to have additional cooling capacity heating capacity uh you have to think about potentially energy recovery when you when you're doing that so it puts a burden on the on the design side to make sure that we design them appropriately and we've been having many conversations about uh, rooms versus wings versus entire buildings uh, going that way. Uh, we're generally not seeing an entire building going that way. You usually see a wing going that way. So that um, if you need a negative pressure area of a building, um, they'd put uh, would put a system in place so that you can exhaust that wing and the, and the system itself has enough capacity to take that section of the building and increase the outside air flow into the building. You have enough chill, chill water capacity or cooling capacity, you have enough boiler capacity. And, you know, generally it's something that, you know, there's, there's pressure on patient rooms these days. So having normal patient rooms versus, you know, specialty uh, patient rooms with negative pressure is always a fine line. And there's been a movement back towards regular patient rooms. So we're seeing the designs moving towards a flexible uh, environment. Um, some some of the buildings we're, we're designing have isolation rooms, uh, you know, like two or three or four uh, clustered uh, in an area so that you can, um, that those areas themselves would have neg the negative pressure systems in place already. Um, you know, so there is, a lot of conversations that are being held early 
in the design process about what the right mix of, of spaces is in the building so that you don't kind of over design the entire building and have a lot of capital equipment sitting there that's underutilized. So, I mean, ballpark, what, what are you seeing as the potential implications for energy consumption and, and cost? Uh, what are the premiums that you think? Um, well, the, the energy prices that jump in these days. Um, I mean, you could use dollars per CFM. It might be you know five or six dollars a CFM, and if you're using you know six air changes, that's one CFM a square foot. So you, I, um, I don't know if I could give you an overall mm -hmm. metric of. Um, but in terms the of the overall air airflow, are you increasing airflow by five percent, ten percent? Do you think? Oh, well, capacity, I should say, system capacity. Um, no, the, the capacities of the patient room capacities are pretty much staying with the six air change rates that we've been yeah. um, out there, for, you know, pretty much forever. Yeah, long um, right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the so that the air quantities haven't changed a lot. But when you go from a recirculating air system to 100 percent outside air system, it yeah. makes a huge difference in the energy consumption. Um, you know, when we design laboratories, there you know, a, a laboratory is generally running 10 air changes per hour. So it's a little bit higher just to make sure that there's good indoor air quality. But those systems, we always have um, energy recovery systems uh, mm -hmm. attached to them. You know, so we have a convector or a heat wheel or something like that that recovers the energy and, and it has much less impact. Uh, if you have sections of a building, you're not necessarily going to be putting in that type of system to react to, um, you know, a, an incident or, you know, a, a short term duration thing. Now, it, you know, some places might elect to go that way, but, um, you know, certainly the move towards electrification and decarbonization, any anything you do is going to have uh, an impact on operational costs, which, um, you know, down the road, you know, people will be wondering why they they might have done it. So, so in terms of of um, you know where we can go from positive to negative, in what ways are you are you as engineers providing some uh, electronic way of um, it, informing the yeah, person well, in, at the room in, or on the floor? Obviously, the BAS knows what's going on. Yeah, so, running, so how are you so, doing that? So when we design the um, the patient rooms themselves, there's usually a supplier box, a VAV box with an electronic controller on it, and there's a return air box with an electronic controller on it. Um, like I said, if if you have a wing, um, you can take that branch duct that feeds multiple patient rooms, and with the damper divert it to an exhaust side. You know, so instead of returning that air to the air handling unit, which does have HEPA filters, it should be able to clean the air before it goes back to the space. But we're able to divert that air from, from the building um, independently and make sure that the supply and the exhaust, the supply and return box, the return box in effect becomes an exhaust box. Mm -hmm. And so that and then that so that you're able to even make them positive or negative by just dialing it up in the building automation system. So it's a relatively uh, straightforward thing to do. Um, and it's usually indicated outside the room. <clears throat> there, there are electronic devices that you know through wall the through the wall uh, devices mm -hmm. that can read the room pressure versus the corridor. It indexes the corridor, so you can tell whether or not it's negative or positive to the corridor. Uh, in the uh, there's also the ball and tube things, which is a less technical tent type of device that the ping pong ball, been, right? the ping pong balls. Yeah, yeah. Um, as long as they're installed the right way, they they react pretty quickly and they're pretty accurate too. So, right. um, so they're both options out there uh, to indicate whether or not it's positive or negative. But um, like I said, it's it's we're not seeing entire buildings being being able to be switched to 100% outside air and have the associated infrastructure um, being designed to be able to support that um, on a normal operating mode. Okay. Can, I, can I ask a question, John? Um, sure. I'm trying to understand why we're talking about 100% outside air. So um, if you bring it down to the AI room level, it only requires, if I'm looking at it correctly, um, minimum outdoor air is two air changes. Right, so correct. What is right, the, but, what, but, it, but if you're that? exhausting the air from the building, 
it has to come from somewhere. So if you have a mix in the building, say mm -hmm. it's only one wing out of eight, then you don't need 100% outside air. But if you're doing the entire building as, as in a negative pressure, then that air in that building, you know, there's, there's some air in the corridors, there's some air in the common areas um, that you can do, but the majority of the air is being exhausted from the building and it has to come from the outside. That's so, so when you're saying 100% outside air, you're talking about exhaust, not supply. Well, when it gets exhausted, it has to come from somewhere. So the, that comes from the outside as compared oh. to inside the building. The so, makeup air, yeah. Yeah, the okay. makeup okay. air, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah. Jason, um, you know, you've been working with Erica Chanoy, who's been heading up the sort of infection control um, guidelines or MGB, um, what, what have you seen and learned coming out of that experience and sort of how, how has it been playing out across our different facilities? And then what, what do you see in some of the um, outside committees that you're sitting on, trade committee, uh, uh, regulatory committees that you're sitting on and what they're talking about? Yeah, thanks, John. I, I think um, for us um, that the, the first wave came on very, very quickly, and we didn't have, uh, we weren't prepared with a comprehensive uh, approach. So the local uh, facilities management teams at all the entities uh, work with local infection control leadership and developed um, at, at, at each facility um, kind of appropriate measures for the, the, the caseload that they were seeing. Um, I, I think uh, there were, and the, the measures varied. Uh, you know, after that first wave, we kind of took a step back and we took a, kind of a, I guess, an accounting of the different measures at different facilities, at the academic medical centers, um, at the um, community hospitals and some of the specialty hospitals. Uh, and then, frankly, Paula, Erica, and myself sat on a, a larger committee with a, a bunch of different folks and started to formulate a comprehensive um, plan because we didn't, we, we suspected there would be a subsequent um, waves of the virus and we didn't want to have uh, differences in our environment of care from facility to facility. Um, we, we really tried to parse things into two buckets. The, the first was um, focused on short term. So it was dealing with existing infrastructure existing facilities and, and what is appropriate for dealing with, um, with this um, disease. Um, and then we also started putting some thought into long-term how we would outfit new facilities um, to deal with a, a pandemic. Um, I, I will say that the, the complexities of dealing with um, existing systems are many. Um, and one of the biggest things we learned early on um, when you're in the middle of operations and you have, um, you know, an active uh, building or campus, trying to change pressurization relationships in existing spaces can come with a lot of peril and unintended consequences. Um, so we we really really focused early on, and, and thanks to the guidance from Paula and Erica, we really focused on the the, the transmission path. Of, of the illness. And as, as Paula said, it was, it was droplet based. Um, and then we really started looking at the, the various procedures and the re real exposure risk to um, staff um, and, and uh, patients. And, and we, we, we ended up coming to the conclusion that most of our systems, the way they were, the way they were configured were appropriate. Uh, we did come up with um, recommendations on, like Paula said, on where to conduct AGPs, but understanding that AGPs are, can, can happen at any time, you know, it was, it wasn't a mandatory requirement. It said if it, if the AII room was available, that's where the AGPs uh, should take place. We rolled up, I guess we spent about four or five months rolling all these recommendations up into a guideline and we called it the, I think it was the blueprint uh, for COVID-19 facilities blueprint. And we rolled that out a, a, across um, the, the the network uh, and subsequent waves, we, we, we were able to uh, successfully have a uniform way of, of managing our facilities uh, with, with COVID patients. 
Um, I think long term, um, you know, I, long term, uh, there were a lot of suggestions. Uh, we looked at a lot of things, UVGI, um, uh, uh, differences in filtration. I think the biggest thing we, we would recommend would be additional AII rooms. Um, we had some discussion about pressurization relationships and ORs and making negative ORs. And we, we never really came, we came to inclusion, we shouldn't do that. But if, if there was a, a, a case that we needed to do that for, that, that we would need to have ante rooms in the ORs um, to successfully maintain the, the proper pressure relationships. Um, we, we, we looked at the ability uh, to have outside, more outside air and in fact, there were some um, guidelines that were coming up from FGI. It looked like they were leaning that way, but ultimately they they didn't make that recommendation. And I think that's because, like Paula said, we we really began to discover more and more about the transmission, and then that th those changes would not necessarily uh, provide a better outcome. Thanks, Jason. Um, so, Vinny. Um... You know, you're you're the CFO. You've been the CFO at several of our hospitals and also outside MGB. And now you're the CFO of the newly formed community hospital division at MGB. What what, what happened? I mean, we I think we all know that the revenue went down, obviously. But I mean, in terms of of the overall impact on. Um, the financials of our system, you know, the impacts I think that we're having are probably the same continuing impacts other systems are having, but also looking down the road and hearing about the kinds of, of uh, engineering systems and man control systems that we're gonna to need to put in increasingly more sophisticated. What kinds of, what kinds of yeah. thoughts come to, you, to mind to you in the, wearing the hat that you wear? Well, uh, John, I would say the first thought that came to mind up until the point of your introduction, I thought I had joined the wrong conference. So I do appreciate <laughs> you asking me that question. The last two conferences I've spoken at have been on climate change and now positive and negative pressure. My accounting friends don't know who I am anymore. So uh, uh, for my my role, you know, on the finance side here uh, and, and uh, obviously, you know, in any sort of typical CFO role, you have responsibilities for uh, the budget, responsibilities for capital investment, and uh, there's a balance there of listening to your experts. And, and in our case at MGB, um, and specifically, I think on this call, as I look around, I see uh, I see you know Justin's here and, and George Player and um, and and uh, and and uh, Justin Ferber, Jason's here and Justin from Newton Wellesley. So we've got some really great experts across our system. And so as a CFO, I think it's my responsibility to listen to them in terms of the recommendations and certainly our business partners. And Alan Ames is doing some work for us on a shelf floor that we have at Newton Wellesley. I think, you know, everybody's in a real crucial time right now with, uh, with what has happened in Massachusetts, not just from uh, the pandemic and the outcomes of that relative to financial pressures, but you know, other operating issues that have come about as a result of the changes in society of the pandemic relative to how people are working and temp labor. And it's, uh, and it's put enormous pressures on all hospitals, including, uh, you know, I'm not sure if when Paul was making his comments around, you know, the land of Oz there, you know, that even the big systems are really struggling financially. And I know it's all relative, but, uh, uh, you know, MGB will lose hundreds of millions of dollars from operations this year. Um, it's not public yet, and I won't say the exact number, but it's it's a big number. So we're not immune to that, uh, to sort of uh, to just sort of breezing through that. And of course, not to speak of what's even occurred in the investment markets uh, for everyone's portfolio. So capital is going to be significantly restricted, and all these things are related as we come out of the pandemic. So. Uh, we are we are struggling, but we're also looking for opportunities to do things right, so that over the long term. Uh, and I think I'm not sure who mentioned it, but that you you want to look back and not say, "Geez, you know, ten years from now, why did they do that?" And even though we're in a restrictive environment, I'd much rather say, "Boy, I'm glad they did that." Uh, and to the extent, as one of our examples, and Alan, without mentioning the entity, Alan Ames was uh, essentially describing what was going on at Newton Wellesley. We have a we have a shelled floor. Uh, we're putting in 24 new beds in between an existing floor and an emergency room. 
And so all of these issues, the things that we learned from uh, from COVID are coming into play. And, and Justin Ferbert, the facilities director, is advocating for additional funding to do the things that Alan talked about in terms of putting controls in the right place uh, to allow us for uh, spend the extra money on uh, on building controls and, and location of HVAC, you know, so that we can flip those rooms on a moment's notice uh, if we have another uh, another event. Um, essentially, uh, uh, you know, we want to be able to have that extra flexibility. So spending some money uh, to to build in flexibility, I think, is a is a good move. Um, and and certainly with what Alan was talking about in terms of uh, the ability to. Uh, flip the floors from normal state into either negative pressure um, or you know isolation rooms. Um, I think that that that's something very worthwhile, something that we've learned uh, dearly through uh, through the pandemic. And not all of our facilities are brand spanking new. At Newton Wellesley, we can only do this on selected floors. The rest of the facility is just too damn old to sort of spend the money. Um, and so we have to do it in, in wings uh, in the right part of campus without you know, throwing money away. So a real delicate balance. And so go easy on your CFOs out there when, when you're presenting these projects to them. They're under a lot of pressure also to you know, spend the right money, spend it smartly, and do what's best for patients in a constrained environment. Thanks, Vinny. You know, I, we're, we're, our, our buildings obviously are becoming increasingly more sophisticated, um, both the systems in the building, but even the, you know, the, the, the delivery of medical care inside the building and the, the kind of procedures and activity that's taking place at the bedside now. And, and uh, so the, the design of the rooms and the systems in the room in order to support the kind of care that's going on at the bedside, which um, is a lot different than what's going on 30, 40 years ago, uh, when some of our buildings were built, uh, it, it just it increases the cost of our facilities geometrically. And uh, on top of all the other um, escalations and uh, challenges that we're facing, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a perfect storm of, of uh, financial challenges at the moment. Um, I'd like to ask, Teresa, are there any questions in the chat? I see we're five, six There's minutes There's been away. some conversations going on. Um, okay, anything uh, worth that you'd like to? Um, I think uh, there's a little bit of talk about the older buildings and also what's going on uh, in milder climates in Europe. Um, it's a little bit different approach that uh, Michael Lorimer spoke to. Um, so I don't know if we wanna. Yeah, Michael, do, do you wanna say, do you wanna share that with the, with the group? Uh, yeah, happy to. Um, there was a question coming through just about openable windows and just what uh, uh, what they can play in this um, in this role of sort of uh, creating local pressure control within spaces. And um, at Dublin Children's Hospital, we designed uh, all inpatient bedrooms on the upper floors were basically naturally ventilated. So we we were able to, you know, from an energy perspective, it was a big win, but also we designed them so that under the uh, parent couch so where the parent would come in and sleep adjacent to the child we could put in retrofit effectively a fan so that you could change the pressure within the space uh, to positive or negative for future flexibility as well but you know I sort of I know when I first came over here that uh, you know that the climate here doesn't isn't quite so forgiving in the winters and uh, and a little bit harsher in the summer so the the natural ventilation role I, I think can have a part to play but perhaps not all year round so um but no, open all windows are you know are very flexible in many ways um but sometimes if you go with the mixed mode so you design for openable windows and mechanical systems you know it's an expensive upfront cost to put in but it does give you that flexibility yeah it's flexibility and i i uh, absolutely agree and it's not that we haven't looked at them and some of the MGB projects coming down the road. And in fact, Spalding Hospital has some, some uh, operable windows, small openings that are possible in the patient rooms, although it, it, the facility manager has to, facility engineer has to open it. It's not patient controlled. Um, I think there's also, you know, and, and we probably don't have much more time to get into this, but Paula, there, you know, there's also concern about infection um, spreading from room to room via outside windows, right? And, and um, I kind of thought that was crazy, um, but- um, I, I think have, the, 
the John the for me for infection control for outside windows, it's more airborne fungi that I'm worried about. I mean, certainly there's a classic study from years ago at Children's Hospital where chickenpox did go out the window and went down the entire corridor um, with outside windows open. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's, for me, it's more, uh, we live in a city, there's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of stuff going on, um, airborne fungi, I mm -hmm. want to keep them out of my hospital. So mm -hmm. there may very well be uh, climates or locations. Um, I went to a, a template hospital out in Modesto, California, once where they had operable windows, and I looked out the window and there was a wheat field right next to it. And I thought, dear God, we're going to have so much fungi coming in these windows. So I think really, I think that operable windows, and I know that they're popular in Europe, um, probably can be used in some ways. That's what, um, what do you call it? Florence Nightingale came up with that to control TV. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really hard to do in a city, I think. Um, John? And in a Northeast climate. I think, I think we could have an hour long conversation on operable windows because. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, just on one side of the building, on the windward side, mm -hmm. it has a higher pressure. On the on the leeward side, it has a lower pressure. Like the air moves around, the temperature, humidity, the security mm -hmm. issues, the you know all the things that go with it, and what comes outside, what comes inside. I mean, just it, yeah, we could we could probably I wouldn't spend be voting an hour. for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, actually, I I, I think it. That's a great idea. I think it is worth having a discussion about operable windows. And are there any circumstances in the care environment within which operable windows and, and uh, you know, bo both from the patient perspective, but also as Paula was indicating, you know, um, obviously if you're next to, um, if you're in the city, it's, it's tough. Um, just from the Pollute general pollute level of pollution, I think, and contaminants. Um, but in what kind of environments might it be possible for there to be operable windows? And uh, obviously, it's not necessarily um, 365, but there are days of the year where it may be possible, and and those are days of the year where you could be saving some energy potentially. So, I think uh, I think I'd like to to rally up a group of people to talk about it and the infection control side of this needs to be important so um, um paul you're invited back for return engagement <laughs> uh, we'll be sending you a food voucher uh, at your time um hey thanks. john can i just add one more comment this is yeah, george, go ahead, george. Yeah. so i i think this is Vinny asked what he was doing here but i think this is a fantastic group to get together because when the Brigham designed in with BR plus A, the ability to make every patient room and every floor in Shapiro negative pressure, yep. we never thought we'd use it, right? And it started right. with a conversation with infection control on the heels of SARS. Yep. So we, you know, we our our team was in, engaged in spending the extra money, um, re redesigning the systems with BR plus A, um, but when when COVID came around, you know, it was a great thing for us to be able to do, especially in the initial phase, because we weren't sure how this disease was reacting, right? Mm -hmm. And it gave all of our staff and patients a comfort level. So it's something we built in, you know, 14 years ago, um, and we used it for the first time a couple of years ago. Um, but Paula, if it wasn't the infection control people starting the conversation with the design team and the operators and um, you know, and everybody, the real estate team that's involved in the project design, it never would have happened. Uh, yep. But I think it will change design moving forward. So these conversations and these diverse groups are fantastic. Well, good. I'm glad you're part of it, George. And uh, time is up. I appreciate John, everybody. Can, yes. Can I have three little things here? If you let okay. me, I promise I won't wax on. Okay. okay. So back to operating rooms, um, intubating a patient with TB going to the OR has been a problem forever because all operating rooms are positive and most don't have anti rooms and it's been a, a point of discussion for years. We've talked we talked about building in our new building in the Cambridge Street project an OR with an anti room. Uh, but the decision was made that we would probably do it in um, legacy space uh, during renovation of thoracic ORs, create an OR with an ante room because that's always been a problem for patients with airborne disease who need to go to the OR. You need a negative space to intubate them. You don't have that in the operating room. So that's something people should always be thinking about. The second thing, um, and the CFO I think will be happy, 
beware of vendors. They, uh, you know, people try desperately to get to the infection control office to sell you their magic UV antimicrobial stuff that's going to save the world. Most of the time they have it wrong. Um, you know, there's limited use of UV and it's very specific. So just beware of people who are going to sell you that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing is, so for the Cambridge Street Project, we certainly, as part of the infection control risk assessment, um, push for many AIR and P, uh, PE rooms in the building baseline. And then for pandemic planning, we did plan for rooms that, for floors where every room can be made negative pressure. Um, not just the whole floor, but every room is individually negative mm. pressure. However, part of the design was they put up, they wanted to create an anteroom, so the designers put up walls um, on the drawings, okay? Nothing's been built yet. I saw the drawings and I was like, oh my God. They put the wall and included the patient bathroom, the entrance to the patient bathroom was in the anteroom. So your isolated patient in the patient room would have to come into the anteroom to go to the bathroom. It hadn't hit anybody until I looked at it that that was totally wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. The bathroom has to be inside the isolation room. They thought they thought they were going to put a mask on the patient, and then staff would have to wear a mask in the ante room. And they'd managed to control this through teaching and operations and policies, which we all know don't work. You need to keep the patient in the isolation room and the entrance to the bathroom in the isolation room. So we eliminated the, there was no other way to put that um, temporary wall up to make an ante room because of the way the room was designed. So we eliminated it. It's just an AII room mm. now without an ante room. So you really have to have your ICPs looking at your drawings. Thanks Paula. And thank you panelists. It was a great discussion. And uh, as I said at the outset, this is a topic we can spend many hours talking about, but this was the primer. And yep. look forward to seeing you all again at the next session.